Well, greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and welcome to worship. We are so glad that you have chosen to spend part of your Sabbath in worship with us. We are on part three of a series on sanctification, the belief that God's grace saves us not only for heaven, but sets us free from the power of sin. John Wesley believed that entire sanctification is attainable in this life and urged the early Methodists to pursue it. Not only that, but we have testimonies of people who experience sanctification. We will hear some of those today and hopefully gain a better understanding of God's grace and how to receive it. So let us begin our worship service together with this responsive reading from Psalm 145. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom. To make known to all people your mighty deeds. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Our opening hymn is number 139, Praise to the Lord the Almighty. Would you stand as you're able? Amen. Our second hymn is number 168, At the Name of Jesus.
You may be seated. Our scripture readings this morning come from Luke chapter 11, verses 5 through 13, and Galatians 5, 5 to 11. Then Jesus said to them, Suppose you have a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, Don't bother me. The door's already locked, and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If then, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? For through the Spirit we eagerly await, by faith, the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. You were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion, whoever that may be, will have to pay the penalty. Brothers and sisters, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our children's message this morning comes from Douglas Talks. You can trust the Bible because it just works. Hey guys, it's me again, Douglas, and I've been doing this series on like why we can trust the Bible. And today I want to talk about the fact that we can trust the Bible because it works, right? Like a life lived God's way is the best life ever. And a lot of people kind of view the Bible as just like a bunch of rules. And God is just like this, this angry guy who's going to bust you up if you, if you don't follow the rules. Like, you better do this or else. And that's like almost true, which is, you know, the way Satan works. Satan takes everything that is good and twists it into bad. He always takes a little nugget of truth and then pours on a bunch of lies. So yeah, it is true. God is the ultimate judge. And the penalty for sin is death. But God sent his son Jesus to pay the penalty for our sins. But you know what? That's not the only thing that comes with sin. Sin always has natural consequences. Every single commandment in the Bible is for our own good. The rules that God gives us are not to ruin our fun. They're instructions for how we can live our best life. You know, my mom and my aunts and my grandma, and pretty much everybody on my mom's side of the family, they really like to cook which is great for me because I like to eat. And it's really often that we'll have a family gathering and somebody will bring something new and people will try it and they'll be like, oh man, can I have the recipe for this? Because they're thinking, you know, this thing turned out really well, so I want to have the instructions for how to make something that tastes like this. And that's like what the Bible is. All of God's commandments are like a recipe for how to live the very best, most powerful and fulfilling life ever. And I believe in the Bible. I believe that we can trust the Bible because... It has proven itself time and time again. The people who have the best life are the people who are living according to God's word. Now, the problem is that sometimes we, we kind of judge good life versus bad life in kind of messed up ways. Like you might say, oh, well, the best life is the one where you're super rich. But I've heard of a lot of rich people who are really empty inside. But if you live God's way, if you live your life according to God's word, your life will be far from empty. You will find fulfillment. You'll have power and peace and love and joy. The Bible says that the fruit of the Spirit, you know, the Spirit of God, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. 
man, those are all like really good things, things I think we all want. And those things come naturally when we are walking in step with Jesus Christ, when we are walking in the Spirit, when we are walking according to what we find in Scripture. And no other religion or worldview can offer that. I'm not saying that you can't ever do something that is good if you're not a Christian. And I'm not saying that if you're a Christian, you can't ever do anything bad. But I am saying that if you are doing something good, you are living according to God's word, whether you know it or not. Other religions and other worldviews, they teach that whatever your quote unquote truth is, is true. That obviously doesn't work because what about people who think that it is a good thing to you know, kidnap people or murder people? No, that idea doesn't work at all. The Bible teaches that God is the ultimate authority. God is the one who tells us what is good and bad, and that works. Other religions and worldviews, they teach us that some people matter and other people don't. And man, we've been seeing so many problems throughout all of human history, and, and even, even right now and today, we see so many problems that arise from that idea. But the Bible teaches that we all stand before God as equals. We are all so loved by God. And we are all important in his eyes. And we all need a savior. And I'm not gonna lie, the Christian life is not easy. A life lived God's way is not an easy life, but it is a good life. It's a life filled with joy and peace and fulfillment and purpose. And no other religion or worldview, certainly no other you know, quote unquote holy text can offer that. So yeah, I think we can absolutely trust the Bible because it just works. But I also think that, that with that comes a real challenge, right? Comes a real responsibility. It is our responsibility as Christians to follow the recipe, so to speak. Because everybody's looking at our lives, right? Everybody's looking at us as Christians. And if we're not living according to what God has commanded, you know, if we're not loving our neighbor, if we're not honoring God, if we're being prideful and selfish, then people will think that that's what the Bible says to be. They'll think that that's what God wants us to be. So yeah, it's important to live God's way for you, right? It's important for your own life to live God's way because that is the path to happiness and fulfillment. But it's also important for others around us, right? God's word tells us how to live in such a way that's best for us and for those around us. And if we trust God, if we follow what he says, we will live our best life ever. We can trust the Bible. Hey guys, I hope you like this. When Jesus rose from the dead, he appeared to his disciples and many other people. The first time he visited the disciples, Thomas was not with them. He refused to believe their testimony until he saw for himself the scars and touched the wound in Jesus' side. Jesus appeared to them again, this time with Thomas present, and invited him to see his hands and touch his wound. And then he said to Thomas, you believe because you have seen. Blessed are those who believe though they have not seen. Even as Douglas made a case for trusting God's word, he talked about what he has seen or experienced as true. In the brokenness of sin, human nature is to distrust but first until we have proof. Actually, it really becomes that way as we grow up. Children are by nature very trusting. We develop this need for proof as we get older because we've experienced being lied to or having our trust broken in other ways. At any rate, today I offer you proof that this doctrine or belief of entire sanctification is true. The grace of God through the Holy Spirit really does transform lives and hearts by setting us free from the power of sin and perfecting believers in the love of God. So let us pray that our spiritual eyes may be opened to God's truth today. Merciful and loving God, thank you for pursuing our hearts and minds and lives even when we are caught up in doubt. Thank you for giving us proof of your grace that we might pursue it more urgently. Quiet our minds and open our hearts to receive your word today, to make us bold, to share the good news of what your grace has done in us so that others may also believe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
There are five questions I wrote in the margins as I read chapter three of Kevin Watson's book, Perfect Love, Recovering Entire Sanctification, The Lost Power of the Methodist Movement. One, what are you preaching or sharing with others? Two, what are you pursuing and how urgently? Three, what do we expect of one another as believers? Four, what are we normalizing? And five, what have you received in order to make God known? The doctrine of entire sanctification in the early days of the Methodist movement was preached and pursued with great urgency. And each time a person experienced sanctification, they were encouraged and welcomed to proclaim what God had done. As they shared their testimony, others either recognized that they too had experienced entire sanctification and could testify to it also, or they were convicted in their spirit to pursue it. It was normal for early Methodists to talk about what God was doing in their lives and even to experience the Holy Spirit in charismatic ways publicly. That is perhaps one of the first splits in the Methodist movement, the divide between the extremely charismatic who believed that if you were not slain in the Spirit nor spoke in tongues, then you weren't really saved, and the more reserved believers who knew in their hearts they were saved but we're not convinced that shouting or making a scene were always manifestations of the Holy Spirit and not acts of self-glorification. Seeing is not always believing. However, without any testimony, doubt easily sets in. Watson wrote, when I teach on the doctrine of entire sanctification, some will, someone will almost always ask me if I know anyone living who has a testimony to that kind of experience. There's an instinctive feeling that if this doctrine is true, it is the kind of thing that should be evident because people actually experience it and testify to it. I believe sanctification is still happening in people's lives, but perhaps we have not been specifically pursuing it personally or teaching about it so that people don't know how to recognize it. Watson gives a threefold response. He says that he knows some people who have this kind of testimony, though not many today. And he and I agree that the reason is because we have not been teaching or pursuing sanctification, at least not to the extent of the early Methodists. He says, in the periods of Methodist history, when this doctrine has been preached with boldness and conviction, it has never returned empty. He writes, Wesley continued to urge Methodists to preach, teach, and press after entire sanctification because he was convinced it was biblical and because many Methodists testified to an experience of God's perfect love. One of the passages that might have influenced John Wesley's belief is what we read this morning in Galatians 5, 5 and 6, and is pictured on the front of your bulletin this week. For through the Spirit, we eagerly await, by faith, the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love, which comes more and more through sanctification. We also noted in the first message in this series, the prayer that Jesus prayed for his disciples, including future ones, asking God to sanctify us. Jesus has asked God to sanctify us. And in Luke 11, we read that as he taught the disciples to pray, he included that they should ask with persistence for the Holy Spirit, and it will be given to them. Jesus taught us to pursue entire sanctification. If it wasn't possible for us to attain, then why should we pursue it? In Christ, all things are possible. Paul writes to the Galatians, and I think John Wesley might write a similar letter to the Methodists today. You were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. I'm confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who's throwing you into confusion, whoever that may be, will have to pay the penalty. 
the Galatian church was being persuaded that they must be circumcised to be saved or to be included among the people of God. This was a Jewish law, but in Christ, the law had been fulfilled. No longer were God's people marked by circumcision, but by the Holy Spirit. Paul says they were running a good race, meaning that they were faithfully preaching the gospel and making disciples as all believers are called to. But they were now being cut off in that race by false doctrine that was not from God. Paul uses the metaphor of how a little bit of yeast spreads and causes the whole batch of dough to rise. He also wrote this to the Corinthians. In other words, a few people preaching a false doctrine will eventually spread until the whole church is thrown off course by it. Or that one error in doctrine will inevitably lead to more errors. But then he says, I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. In other words, Paul trusted that, they, that as they pursued the Lord, the Holy Spirit would sanctify their doctrine and bring them back to the truth of God. He also gives somewhat of a warning not to be the one who is confusing other believers because there will be a penalty to pay. Now this may refer to the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 17, verses 1 and 2. Jesus says, temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to him by whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. And even here, Jesus continues by teaching about forgiveness, which we are enabled to offer as we are sanctified. He says, take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times and says, I repent, you must forgive him. Friends, without the perfect love of God, we are not able to continue to forgive a person who repeatedly sins against us. Jesus knows that. So he prayed that we may be sanctified and taught us to pursue sanctification and continues to offer that sanctification by his Holy Spirit. So what does it look like to be sanctified? How do we know if we have been or are in the process of being sanctified? Is it something that happens and then we're perfect? Or do we have a choice to live sanctified or not? Well, allow me to answer these questions by sharing a couple of testimonies which Kevin Watson shared in his book. He wrote, Confessing sin week after week in the band meetings would often bring people to a deep sense of their own brokenness before God. They would despair of their ability to rescue themselves. Some Methodists found that it was at this low point that God met them and delivered them from being a vile sinner, filled them with the perfect love of God that casts out sin and gave them a clean heart. This was the testimony that Mr. Pritchard shared with his band in 1762, which was reported to Wesley by one of his traveling preachers. In humble faith, Pritchard asked Jesus to give him a clean heart, and he heard Jesus say in his spirit, I will. Be thou clean. As soon as Pritchard heard this word, he also felt a cold, hard bar across his heart break. Then he testified, All my soul was filled with love, nor could I doubt, but Jesus had made me clean. Through the word which he had spoken to my soul. As often happened in these Methodist meetings, when one person testified to God's work in their lives, Many other people had similar experiences. The work of God spread in these communal gatherings like a holy virus. Now this is where I wrote in the margin, were, the, were their eyes opened by the testimony to recognize God's work in themselves too? Or were they in some way trying to outdo one another in their testimonies? I suspect there may have been a little bit of both at times. But for the most part, sanctification is not something you can fake. Either you have received a clean heart and have been set free from the power of sin in order to love, or you haven't, and that would come out clearly in these discipleship bands and in their everyday lives. Here's another example from Watson's book. 
Adam Clark was one of the great theologians immediately following the founding generation of British Methodists. He wrote a letter to Wesley in 1784 describing his desperate determination to have his heart cleansed from all sin. After experiencing entire sanctification, Clark found that the experience was difficult to continue to walk in and that he had to seek God's grace continuously to maintain the gift that he had received. There are two opposite and equal mistakes that believers have made over the centuries. The first is, as Freeborn Garrison, an early Methodist Amer American preacher, noted, to mistakenly believe that having faith in Jesus and experiencing forgiveness of their sins meant that the work is complete. If we are faithful to pursue the grace of God, we will soon realize that there is more work to be done in our souls, writes Gerritsen. To him, the goal was for Christians to realize that God wants to bring them entirely into alignment with the Spirit's will for their lives. Watson wrote, Gerritsen emphasized in his sermon that entire sanctification is by faith, just as justification is by faith in Christ. When someone receives the gift of faith, the Christian grows from immature faith toward mature faith. The Christian, as they grow in maturity, is governed in new and deeper ways by the grace of God. So for some, entire sanctification happens in a moment. They are set free from the power of sin and filled with the perfect love of God. The second mistake is believing that they don't have to maintain that clean heart which for Gerritsen means that, it, that sanctification is a process of growth in maturity of faith, the rule of God by grace in a person's heart and life. Either way, the question is, are you pursuing sanctification? Is it what you expect of yourself and other believers? And if so, then are you talking about it? How are you pursuing sanctification or teaching others to pursue it? You might meet with a prayer partner weekly or a weekly band or small group meeting for the purpose of confession, prayer, and accountability. This might even look like participating in a Celebrate Recovery step study. The concept is very much the same, just with a deeper dive into scripture and accountability to surrendering specific character flaws to God's work maybe one at a time, or maybe all at once. As Jesus has taught us in Luke 11, ask for sanctification, seek it, knock on the door of heaven and it will be open to you. Even if it doesn't happen all at once or right away, be persistent. You may have a longer journey than someone else. You may be stuck under a pile of doubt because you haven't seen it. But ask, seek, and knock for it, and you will receive the Holy Spirit and the righteousness that is displayed through perfect love. Remember, even if you know you have been set free from the power of sin, you still have to maintain that clean heart in pursuing a personal relationship with Jesus Christ every day. Philippians 1, 6 reads, I am sure that he who began a good work in you will carry it out to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. That means that God's work in you is not done until your days on this earth are done. Yes, you can achieve sanctification. You can be made perfect in love. But because we live in a, a world that is ruled by sin, we will constantly be battling our free will against God's will. This sinful nature no longer has power over us, so we don't have to give in to that free will. But that doesn't mean that we become controlled by the Holy Spirit, just growing more and more submissive to him. Will you pray with me? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for pursuing our hearts and minds and lives. Forgive us when we are not constantly pursuing your grace. 
Forgive us when we choose to take the easy way instead of the narrow way. We ask you to give us the Holy Spirit. Fill us with your love and your grace that each one would be set free from the power of sin and grow more and more submissive to your Holy Spirit and your will for our lives. Teach us to love as you love and to live as Christ taught us to live. Teach us to boldly share the good news of your grace so that others would be set free by the gift of Jesus Christ and the work of your Holy Spirit in their lives. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 569. We have a story to tell to the nations.
Receive these words as your benediction. Go forth in peace, receiving the grace of God to set you free from sin and sanctify you more and more in his image. Amen.